Hello, welcome to the short story workshop. My name is Matt Bowles. I'm here with Melody Bowles and Simone King. Today we are going to be talking about the Body Snatcher by Robert Louis Stevenson. So, Mel, you picked this story, kind of, with some help. Uh, please introduce us. So this is a horror story based on some real life murders that happened in Edinburgh in the 1800s. Just to warn you, it is a horror story. It's bone chilling, talks a lot about corpses, so it may not be the episode for you, but it is a really great atmospheric horror story. If you like the genre, you need to listen to this story. Excellent. Here it is, The Body Snatcher by Robert Louis Stevenson. Every night in the year, four of us sat in the small parlour of the George at Debenham, the Undertaker and the Landlord and Fetz and myself. Sometimes there would be more, but blow high, blow low, come rain or snow or frost, we four would be each planted in his own particular armchair. Fetz was an old drunken Scotchman, a man of education, obviously, and a man of some property, since he lived in idleness. He had come to Debenham years ago, while still young, and by a mere continuance of living had grown to be an adopted townsman. His blue camlet cloak was a local antiquity, like the church spire. His place in the parlour at the George, his absence from church, his old, crapulous, disreputable vices, were all things of course in Debenham. He had some vague radical opinions and some fleeting infidelities, which he would now and again set forth and emphasise with tottering slaps upon the table. He drank rum, five glasses regularly, every evening, and for the greater portion of his nightly visit to the George sat, with his glass in his right hand, in a state of melancholy, alcoholic saturation. We called him the doctor, for he was supposed to have some special knowledge of medicine, and had been known, upon a pinch, to set a fracture or reduce a dislocation. But beyond these slight particulars, we had no knowledge of his character and antecedents. One dark winter night, it had struck nine some time before the landlord joined us, there was a sick man in the George, a great neighbouring proprietor suddenly struck down with apoplexy on his way to the Parliament, and the great man's still greater London doctor had been telegraphed to his bedside. It was the first time that such a thing had happened in Debenham, for the railway was but newly open, and we were all proportionately moved by the occurrence. He's come, said the landlord, after he had filed and lighted his pipe. He, said I, who, not the doctor? Himself, replied our host. What is his name? Dr. McFarlane, said the landlord. Fetz was through his third tumbler, stupidly fuddled, now nodding over, now staring madly around him. But at the last word he seemed to awaken and repeated the name McFarlane twice, quietly enough the first time, but with sudden emotion at the second. Yes, said the landlord. That's his name, Dr. Wolf McFarlane. Fetz became instantly sober, his eyes awoke, his voice became clear, loud and steady, his language forcible and earnest. We were all startled by the transformation, as if a man had risen from the dead. I beg your pardon, he said. I'm afraid I've not been paying much attention to your talk. Who is this Wolf McFarlane? And then, when he had heard the landlord out, it cannot be, it cannot be, he added. And yet I would like well to see him face to face. Do you know him, doctor? asked the undertaker with a gasp. God forbid, was the reply. And yet the name is a strange one. It, it was too much to fancy too. Tell me, landlord, is he old? Well, said the host, he's not a young man, to be sure, and his hair is white, but he looks younger than you. He is older, though, he is older, but with a slap upon the table. It's the rum you see in my face, rum and sin. This man, perhaps, may have an easy conscience and a good digestion. Conscience, hear me speak. You would think I was some good, old, decent Christian, would you not? But no, not I. Never canted. Voltaire might have canted if he'd stood in my shoes, but the brains, with a rattling flip on his bald head, the brains were clear and active, and I saw and made no deductions. If you know this doctor, I ventured to remark after a somewhat awful pause, I should gather that you do not share the landlord's good opinion. Fetz paid no regard to me. Yes, he said with sudden decision. I must see him face to face. There was another pause, and then a door was closed rather sharply on the first floor, and a step was heard upon the stair. That's the doctor, cried the landlord. Look sharp and you can catch him. It was but two steps from the small parlour to the door of the old George Inn. The wide oak staircase landed almost in the street. There was room for a turkey rug and nothing more between the threshold and the last round of the descent. But this little space was every evening brilliantly lit up, not only by the light upon the stair and the great signal lamp below the sign, 
by the warm radiance of the barroom window. The George Rush brightly advertised itself to passers-by in the cold street. Fetz walked steadily to the spot, and we, who were hanging behind, beheld the two men meet, as one of them had phrased it, face to face. Dr. McFarlane was alert and vigorous. His white hair set off his pale and placid, although energetic, countenance. He was richly dressed in the finest of broadcloth and the whitest of linen, with a great gold watch chain and studs and spectacles of the same precious material. He wore a broad folded tie, white and speckled with lilac, and he carried on his arm a comfortable driving coat of fur. There was no doubt but he became his years, breathing, as he did, of wealth and consideration, and it was a surprising contrast to see our parlour sot, bold, dirty, pimpled, and robed in his old camlet cloak, confront him into the bottom of the stairs. McFarlane, he said somewhat loudly, more like a herald than a friend. The great doctor pulled up short on the fourth step, as though the familiarity of the address surprised and somewhat shocked his dignity. Toddy McFarlane, repeated Fetz. The London man almost staggered. He stared for the swiftest of seconds at the man before him, glanced behind him with a sort of scare, and then in a startled whisper, Fetz, he said, you. I, said the other, me. Do you think I was dead too? We are not so easy shut of our acquaintance. Hush, hush, exclaimed the doctor. Hush, hush, this meeting is so unexpected, I can see you are unmanned. I hardly knew you, I confess at first, but I am overjoyed, overjoyed to have this opportunity. For the present it must be how do you do and goodbye in one. My fly is waiting and I must not fall the train. But you shall let me see, yes, you shall give me your address and you can count on early news of me. We must do something for you, Fetz. I fear you're out at elbows, but we must see to that old lang sign at once we sang at suppers. Money, cried Fetz, money from you. The money that I had from you is lying where I cast it in the rain. Dr. McFarlane had talked himself into some measure of superiority and confidence, but the uncommon energy of this refusal cast him back into his first confusion. A horrible, ugly look came and went across his almost venerable countenance. My dear fellow, he said, be it as you please, my last thought is to offend you. I would intrude on none. I will leave you my address, however. I do not wish it. I do not wish to know the roof that shelters you, interrupted the other. I heard your name. I feared it might be you. I wish to know if, after all, there were a god. I know now that there is none. Be gone! He still stood in the middle of the rug, between the stair and doorway, and the great London physician, in order to escape, would be forced to step to one side. It was plain that he hesitated before the thought of this humiliation. White as he was, there was a dangerous glitter in his spectacles, but while he still paused uncertain, he became aware that the driver of his fly was peering in from the street at this unusual scene, and caught a glimpse at the same time of our little body from the parlour, huddled by the corner of the bar. The presence of so many witnesses decided him at once to flee. He crouched together, rushing on the wainscot, and made a dart like a serpent, striking for the door. But his tribulation was not entirely at an end, for even as he was passing, Fetz clutched him by the arm, and these words came in a whisper, and yet painfully distinct. Have you seen it again? The great rich London doctor cried out aloud with a sharp, throttling cry. He dashed his questioner across the open space, and with his hands over his head, fled out of the door like a detected thief. Before it had occurred to one of us to make a movement, the fly was already rattling toward the station. The scene was over like a dream, but the dream had left proofs and traces of its passage. Next day, the servant found the fine gold spectacles broken on the threshold, and that very night we were all standing breathless by the barroom window, and Fetz at our side, sober, pale, and resolute in look. "'God protect us, Mr. Fetz,' said the landlord, coming first into possession of his customary senses. "'What in the universe is all this? These are strange things you have been saying.' Fetz turned towards us. We looked us each in succession in the face. "'See if you can hold your tongues,' said he. "'That man McFarlane is not safe to cross. "'Those that have done so already have repented it too late.' "'And then, without so much as finishing his third glass, "'Farless waiting for the other two, "'he bade us goodbye and went forth, "'under the lamp of the hotel, into the black night. "'We three turned to our places in the parlour, "'with a big red fire and four clear candles, "'and as we recapitulated what had passed, "'the first chill of our surprise soon changed "'into a glow of curiosity. "'We sat late,' It was the latest session I have known in the old George. Each man, before we parted, had his theory that he was bound to prove, and none of us had any nearer business in this world than to track out the past of our condemned companion and surprise the secret that he shared with the great London doctor. 
It is no great boast, but I believe I was a better hand at worming out a story than either of my fellows at the George. And perhaps there is now no other man alive who would narrate you the following foul and unnatural events. In his young days, Fett studied medicine in the schools of Edinburgh. He had talent of a kind, the talent that picks up swiftly what it hears and readily retails it for its own. He worked little at home, but he was civil, attentive and intelligent in the presence of his masters. They soon pipped him out as a lad who listened closely and remembered well. Nay, strange as it seemed to me when I first heard it, he was in those days well favoured and pleased by his exterior. There was at that period a certain extramural teacher of anatomy, whom I shall here side designate by the letter K. His name was subsequently too well known. The man who bore it skulked through the streets of Edinburgh in disguise, while the mob that applauded at the execution of Burke called loudly for the blood of his employer. But Mr. K was then at the top of his vogue. He enjoyed a popularity due partly to his own talent and address, partly to the incapacity of his rival, the university professor. The students, at least, swore by his name, and Fetz believed himself, and was believed by others, to have laid the foundations of success when he had acquired the favour of this meteorically famous man. Mr. K was a bon vivant as well as an accomplished teacher. He liked a sly illusion no less than a careful preparation. In both capacities, Fetz enjoyed and deserved his notice, and by the second year of his attendance he held the half-regular position of second demonstrator or sub-assistant in his class. In this capacity, the charge of the theatre and lecture room devolved in particular upon his shoulders. He had to answer for the cleanliness of the premises and the conduct of the other students, and it was a part of his duty to supply, receive, and divide the various subjects. It was with a view to this last, at that time very delicate, affair that he was lodged by Mr. K in the same wind and at last in the same building with the dissecting rooms. Here, after a night of turbulent pleasures, his hand still tottering, his sight still misty and confused, he would be called out of bed in the black hours before the winter dawn by the unclean and desperate interlopers who supplied the table. He would open the door to these men, since infamous throughout the land. He would help them with their tragic burden, pay them their sordid price, and remain alone, when they were gone, with the unfriendly relics of humanity. From such a scene he would return to snatch another hour or two of slumber, to repair the abuses of the night, and refresh himself with the labours of the day. Few lads could have been more insensible to the impressions of a life thus passed among the unsigns of mortality. His mind was closed against all general considerations. He was incapable of interest in the fate and fortunes of another, slave of his own desires and low ambitions. Cold, light, and selfish in the last resort, he had that modicum of prudence, miscalled morality, which keeps a man from inconvenient drunkenness or punishable theft. He coveted, besides, a measure of consideration from his masters and his fellow pupils, and he had no desire to fail conspicuously in the external parts of life. Thus he made it his pleasure to gain some distinction in his studies, and day after day rendered unimpeachable eye service to his employer, Mr. K. For his day of work he indemnified himself by nights of roaring, blaggardly enjoyment, and when that balance had been struck, the organ that he called his conscience declared itself content. The supply of subjects was a continual trouble for him as well as to his master. In the large and busy class, the raw material of the anatomists kept perpetually running out, and the business thus rendered necessary was not only unpleasant in itself, but threatened dangerous consequences to all who were concerned. It was the policy of Mr. K to ask no questions in his dealings with the trade. They bring the body and we pay the price, he used to say, dwelling on the alliteration, quid pro quo. And again, somewhat profanely, Ask no questions, he would tell his assistants, for conscience sake. There was no understanding that the subjects were provided by the crime of murder. Had that idea been brought to him in words, he would have recoiled in horror, but the lightness of his speech upon so grave a matter was, in itself, an offence against good manners and a temptation to the men with whom he dealt. Fetz, for instance, had often remarked to himself upon the singular freshness of the bodies. He had been struck again and again by the hangdog, abominable looks of the ruffians who came to him before the dawn, and putting things together clearly in his private thoughts, he perhaps attributed a meaning too immoral and too categorical to the unguarded counsels of his master. He understood his duty, in short, to have three branches, 
to take what was brought, to pay the price, and to avert the eye from any evidence of crime. One November morning, this policy of silence was put sharply to the test. He had been awake all night with a racking toothache, pacing his room like a caged beast on throwing himself in fury on his bed, and had fallen at last into the profound, uneasy slumber that so often follows on a night of pain, when he was awakened by the third or fourth angry repetition of the concerted signal. There was a thin, bright moonshine. It was bitter cold, windy and frosty. The town had not yet awakened, but an indefinable stir already preluded the noise and business of the day. The ghouls had come later than usual, and they seemed more than usually eager to be gone. Fetz, sick with sleep, lighted them upstairs. He heard their grumbling Irish voices through a dream, and as they stripped the sack from their sad merchandise, he leaned dozing, with his shoulder propped against the wall. He had to shake himself to find the men their money. As he did so, his eyes lighted on the dead face. He started. He took two steps nearer, with the candle raised. God Almighty, he cried. That, that's Jane Galbraith. The men answered nothing, but they shuffled nearer the door. I know her, I tell you, he continued. She was alive and hearty yesterday. It's impossible she can be dead. It's impossible you should have got this body fairly. Sure, sir, you're mistaken entirely, said one of the men. But the other looked Fetz darkly in the eyes and demanded the money on the spot. It was impossible to misconceive the threat or to exaggerate the danger. The lad's heart failed him. He stammered some excuses, counted out the sum, and saw his hateful visitors depart. No sooner were they gone than he hastened to confirm his doubts. By a dozen unquestionable marks he identified the girl he had jested with the day before. He saw with horror marks upon her body that might well betoken violence. A panic seized him and he took refuge in his room. There he reflected at length over the discovery that he had made, considered soberly the bearing of Mr K's instructions and the danger to himself of interference in so serious a business, and at last, in sore perplexity, determined to wait for the advice of his immediate superior, the class assistant. This was a young doctor, Wolf McFarlane, a high favourite among all the reckless students, clever, dissipated and unscrupulous to the last degree. He had travelled and studied abroad. His manners were agreeable and a little forward. He was an authority on the stage, skilful on the ice or the links of skate or golf club, he dressed with nice audacity, and to put the finishing touch upon his glory, he kept a gig and a strong trotting horse. With Fetz he was on terms of intimacy, indeed their relative positions called for some community of life, and when subjects were scarce the pair would drive far into the country in Macfarlane's gig, visit and desecrate some lonely graveyard, and return before dawn with their booty to the door of the dissecting room. On that particular morning Macfarlane arrived somewhat earlier than his wont. Fetz heard him and met him on the stairs, told him his story, and showed him the cause of his alarm. Macfarlane examined the marks on her body. Yes, he said with a nod. It looks fishy. Well, what should I do? asked Fetz. Do, repeated the other. Do you want to do anything? Least said, soonest mended, I should say. Someone else might recognise her, objected Fetz. She was as well known as the Castle Rock. Well, hope not, said Macfarlane. And if anybody does, well, you didn't, don't you see? And there's an end. The fact is, this has been going on too long. Stir up the mud and you'll get K into the most unholy trouble. You'll be in a shocking box yourself. So will I, if you come to that. I should like to know how any one of us would look, or what the devil we should have to say for ourselves in any Christian witness box. For me, you know, there's one thing certain, that practically speaking, all our subjects have been murdered. McFarlane, cried Fetz. Come now, sneered the other, as if you hadn't suspected it yourself. Suspecting is one thing, and proof another, yes I know, and I'm sorry as you are this should have come here, tapping the body with his cane. The next best thing for me is not to recognise it, and, he added coolly, I don't. You may, if you please. I don't dictate, but I think a man of the world would do as I do. And I may add, I fancy that is what K would look for at our hands. The question is, why did he choose us two for his assistance? And I answer, because he didn't want old wives. 
This was the tone of all others to affect the mind of a lad like Fetz. He agreed to imitate McFarlane. The body of the unfortunate girl was duly dissected, and no one remarked or appeared to recognise her. One afternoon, when his day's work was over, Fetz dropped into a popular tavern and found McFarlane sitting with a stranger. This was a small man, very pale and dark, with coal black eyes. The cut of his features gave a promise of intellect and refinement, which was but feebly realised in his manners, for he proved, upon a nearer acquaintance, coarse, vulgar, and stupid. He exercised, however, a very remarkable control over McFarlane, issued orders like the great Barshaw, became inflamed at the least discussion of delay, and commented red- rudely on the civility with which he was obeyed. This most offensive person took a fancy to Fetz on the spot, plied him with drinks, and honoured him with unusual confidences on his past career. If a tenth part of what he confessed were true, he was a very loathsome rogue, and the lad's vanity was tickled by the attention of so experienced a man. I'm a pretty bad fellow myself, the stranger remarked, but McFarlane is the boy, Toddy McFarlane I call him. Toddy, order your friend another glass. Or it might be, Toddy, you jump up and shut the door. Toddy hates me, he said again. Oh yes, Toddy, you do. Don't you call me that confounded name, growled McFarlane. Hear him. Did you ever see the lad's plain knife? You'd like to do that all over my body, remarked the stranger. We medicals have a better way than that, said Fetz. When we dislike a dead friend of ours, we dissect him. McFarlane looked up sharply, as though this jest was scarcely to his mind. The afternoon passed. Grey, for that was the stranger's name, invited Fetz to join them at dinner, ordered a feast so sumptuous that the tavern was thrown into commotion, and when all was done, commanded McFarlane to settle the bill. It was late before they separated. The man Grey was incapably drunk. McFarlane, sobered by his fury, chewed the cud of the money he had been forced to squander and the slights he had been obliged to swallow. Fetz, with various liquors singing in his head, returned home with devious footsteps and a mind entirely in abeyance. Next day, McFarlane was absent from the class, and Fetz smiled to himself as he imagined him still squiring the intolerable grey from tavern to tavern. As soon as the hour of liberty had struck, he posted from place to place in quest of his last night's companions. He could find them, however, nowhere, so returned early to his rooms, went early to bed, and slept the sleep of the just. At four in the morning he was awakened by the well-known signal. Descending to the door, he was filled with astonishment to find McFarlane with his gig, and in the gig one of those long and ghastly packages with which he was so well acquainted. What? he cried. Have you been out alone? How did you manage? But McFarlane silenced him roughly, bidding him turn to business. When they had got the body upstairs and laid it on the table, McFarlane made at first as if he were going away. Then he paused and seemed to hesitate. And then, you had better look at the face, said he, in tones of some constraint. You had better, he repeated, as Fetz only stared at him in wonder. But where and how did you come by it? cried the other. Look at the face, was the only answer. Fetz was staggered. Strange doubts assailed him. He looked from the young doctor to the body and then back again. At last, with a start, he did as he was bidden. He had almost expected the sight that met his eyes, and yet the shock was cruel. To see, fixed in the rigidity of death and naked on that coarse layer of sackcloth, the man whom he had left well clad and full of meat and sin upon the threshold of a tavern, awoke, even in the faultless fetes, some of the terrors of the conscience. It was a crass to be which re-echoed in his soul that the tomb who he had known should have come to lie upon these icy tables. Yet these were only secondary thoughts. His first concern regarded Wolf. Unprepared for a challenge so momentous, he knew not how to look his comrade in the face. He durst not meet his eye, and he had neither words nor voice at his command. It was Macfarlane himself who made the first advance. He came up quietly behind and laid his hand gently but firmly on the other's shoulder. Richardson, said he, may have the head. Now Richardson was a student who had long been anxious for that portion of the human subject to dissect. There was no answer, and the murderer resumed, Talking of business, you must pay me. Your accounts, you see, must tally. Fetz found a voice, the ghost of his own. Pay you, he cried. Pay you for that? Why, yes, of course you must. By all means, and on every possible account, you must, returned the other. I dare not give it for nothing. You dare not take it for nothing. It would compromise us both. This is another case, like Jane Galbraith's. 
The more things are wrong, the more we must act as if all were right. Where does old K keep his money? There, answered Fetz hoarsely, pointing to a cupboard in the corner. Give me the key then, said the other calmly, holding out his hand. There was an instant's hesitation, and the die was cast. Macfarlane could not suppress a nervous twitch, the infinitesimal mark of an immense relief as he felt the key between his fingers. He opened the cupboard, brought out pen and ink and a paper book that stood in one compartment, and separated from the funds in a drawer a sum suitable for the occasion. Now, look here, he said. There is the payment made, first proof of your good faith, first step to your security. You have now to clinch it by a second. Enter the payment in your book, and then you, for your part, may defy the devil. The next few seconds were for Fetz an agony of thought, but in balancing his terrors it was the most immediate that triumphed. Any future difficulty seemed almost welcome if he could avoid a present quarrel with Macfarlane. He set down the candle which he had been carrying all this time, and with a steady hand entered the date, the nature, and the amount of the transaction. And now, said Macfarlane, it's only fair that you should pocket the lucre. I've had my share already. By the by, when a man of the world falls into a bit of luck, has a few shillings extra in his pocket, I'm ashamed to speak of it, but there's a rule of conduct in the case. No treating, no purchase of expensive class books, no squaring of old debts. Borrow, don't lend. Macfarlane, began Fetz, still somewhat hoarsely, I have put my neck in a halter to oblige you. To oblige me, cried Wolf. Oh, come, you did as near as I can see the matter what you downright had to do in self-defence. Suppose I got into trouble, where would you be? This second little matter flows clearly from the first. Mr Grey is the continuation of Miss Galbraith. You can't begin and then stop. If you begin, you must keep on beginning, that's the truth. No rest for the wicked. A horrible sense of blackness and treachery of fate seized hold upon the soul of the unhappy student. My God, he cried, but what have I done? And when did I begin? To be made a class assistant in the name of reason? Where's the harm in that? Service wanted the position, service might have got it. Would he have been where I am now? My dear fellow, said Macfarlane, what a boy you are. What harm has come to you? What harm can come to you if you hold your tongue? Why, man, do you know what this life is? There are two squads of us, the lions and the lambs. If you're a lamb, you'll come to lie upon these tables like Grey or Jane Galbraith. If you're a lion, you'll live and drive a horse like me, like Kay, like all the world of any wit or courage. You're staggered at the first, but look at Kay. My dear fellow, you're clever, you have pluck. I like you, and Kay likes you. You were born to lead the hunt, and I tell you on my honour and my experience of life. Three days from now, you'll laugh at all these scarecrows like a high school boy at a far. And with that, Macfarlane took his departure and drove off up the wind in his gig to get under cover before daylight. Fetz was fuss left alone with his regrets. He saw the miserable peril in which he stood involved. He saw with inexpressible dismay that there was no limit to his weakness, and that, from concession to concession, he had fallen from the arbiter of Macfarlane's destiny to his paid and helpless accomplice. He would have given the world to have been a little braver at the time, if it did not occur to him that he might still be brave. The secret of Jane Galbraith and the cursed entry in the daybook closed his mouth. Hours passed, the class began to arrive, the members of the unhappy Grey were dealt out to one and to another, and received without remark. Richardson was made happy with the head, and before the hour of freedom rang, Fetz trembled with exultation to perceive how far they had already gone towards safety. For two days he continued to watch, with increasing joy, the dreadful process of disguise. On the third day, Macfarlane made his appearance. He had been ill, he said, but he made up for lost time by the energy with which he directed the students. To Richardson in particular, he extended the most valuable assistance and advice, and that student, encouraged by the praise of the demonstrator, burned high with ambitious hopes and saw the medal already in his grasp.
Before the week was out, McFarlane's prophecy had been fulfilled. Fetz had outlived his terrors and had forgotten his baseness. He began to plume himself upon his courage and had so arranged the story in his mind that he could look back on these events with an unhealthy pride. Of his accomplice, he saw but little. They met, of course, in the business of the class. They received their orders together from Mr. K. At times they had a word or two in private, and Macfarlane was from first to last particularly kind and jovial. But it was plain that he avoided any reference to their common secret, and even when Fetz whispered to him that he had cast in his lot with the lions and forsworn the lambs, he only signed him smilingly to hold his peace. At length an occasion arose which threw the pair once more into a closer union. Mr. K was again short of subjects, pupils were eager, and it was a part of this teacher's pretensions to be always well supplied. At the same time there came the news of a burial in the rustic graveyard of Glencourse. Time had little changed the place in question. It stood then, as now, upon a crossroad, out of call of human habitations and buried fathom deep in the foliage of six cedar trees. The cries of the sheep upon the neighbouring hills, the streamlets upon either hand, one loudly singing among pebbles, the other dripping furtively from pond to pond, the stir of the wind in mountainous old flowering chestnuts, and once in seven days the voice of the bell and the old tunes of the precentor were the only sounds that disturbed the silence around the rural church. The resurrection man, to use a byname of the period, was not to be deterred by any of the sanctities of customary piety. It was part of his trade to despise and desecrate the scrolls and trumpets of old tombs, the paths worn by the feet of worshippers and mourners, and the offerings and the inscriptions of bereaved affection. To rustic neighbourhoods, where love is more than commonly tenacious, and where some bonds of blood or fellowship unite the entire society of a parish, the body snatcher, far from being repelled by natural respect, was attracted by the ease and safety of the task. To bodies that had been laid in earth, in joyful expectation of a far different awakening, there came the hasty, lamplit, terror-haunted resurrection of the spade and mattock. The coffin was forced, the cerements torn, and the melancholy relics, clad in sackcloth, after being rattled for hours on moonless byways, were at length exposed to uttermost indignities before a class of gaping boys. Somewhat as two vultures may swoop upon a dying lamb, Fetz and Macfarlane were to be let loose upon a grave in that green and quiet resting place. The wife of a farmer, a woman who had lived for sixty years and been known for nothing but good butter and a godly conversation, was to be rooted from her grave at midnight and carried, dead and naked, to that faraway city that she had always honoured with her Sunday's best. The place beside her family was to be empty till the crack of doom, her innocent and almost venerable members to be exposed to that last curiosity of the anatomist. Late one afternoon the pair set forth, well wrapped in cloaks and furnished with a formidable bottle. It rained without remission, a cold, dense, lashing rain. Now and again there blew a puff of wind, but these sheets of falling water kept it down. Bottle and all, it was a sad and silent drive as far as Penniquy, where they were to spend the evening. They stopped once to hide their implements in a thick bush, but not far from the churchyard, and once again at the fisher's tryst to have a toast before the kitchen fire and bury their nips of whiskey with a glass of ale. When they reached their journey's end, the gig was housed, the horse was fed and comforted, and the two young doctors in a private room sat down to the best dinner and the best wine the house afforded. The lights, the fire, the beating rain upon the window, the cold, incongruous work that lay before them added zest to their enjoyment of the meal. With every glass their cordiality increased. Soon Macfarlane handed a little pile of gold to his companion. A compliment, he said. Between friends, these little accommodations ought to fly like pipe lights. Fetz pocketed the money and applauded the sentiment to the echo. You are a philosopher, he cried. I was an ass till I knew you, you and Kay. Between you, by the Lord Harry, but you'll make a man of me. Of course we shall, applauded Macfarlane. A man... I tell you, it required a man to back me up the other morning. There are some big, brawling, 40-year-old cowards who would have turned sick of the look of the dead thing, but not you. You kept your head. I watched you. Well, and why not? Fetz Fuzz vaunted himself. It was no affair of mine. There was nothing to gain on the one side but disturbance, and on the other I could count on your gratitude, don't you see? and he slapped his pocket till the gold pieces rang. 
Macfarlane somehow felt a certain touch of alarm at these unpleasant words. He may have regretted that he had taught his young companion so successfully, but he had no time to interfere, for the other noisily continued in its boastful strain. The great thing is not to be afraid. Now, between you and me, I don't want to hang, that's practical, but for all Kant Macfarlane I was born with a contempt. Hell, God, devil, right, wrong, sin, crime, all the other gallery of curiosities. They may frighten boys, but men of the world like you and me despise them. Here's to the memory of Grey. It was by this time growing somewhat late. The gig, according to order, was brought round to the door with both lamps brightly shining and the young men had to pay their bill and take the road. They announced that they were bound for Peebles, and drove in that direction till they were clear of the last houses of the town, then, extinguishing the lamps, returned upon their course and followed a by-road toward Glencourse. There was no sound but that of their own passage and the incessant, strident pouring of the rain. It was pitch dark. Here and there a white gate or a white stone in the wall guided them for a short space across the night, but for the most part it was at a foot pace, and, almost groping, they picked their way through that resonant blackness to their solemn and isolated destination. In the sunken woods that traversed the neighbourhood of the burying ground, the last glimmer failed them, and it became necessary to kindle a match and re one of the lanterns of the gig. Thus, under the dripping trees, and environed by huge and moving shadows, they reached the scene of their unhallowed labours. They were both experienced in such affairs and powerful with the spade, and they had scarce been twenty minutes at their task before they were rewarded by a dull rattle on the coffin lid. At the same moment, Macfarlane, having hurt his hand upon a stone, flung it carelessly above his head. The grave in which they now stood almost to the shoulders was close to the edge of the plateau of the graveyard, and the gig lamp had been propped, the better to illuminate their labours, against a tree, and on the immediate verge of the steep bank descending to the stream. Chance had taken a sure aim with the stone. There came a clang of broken glass. Night fell upon them. Sounds alternately dull and ringing announced the bounding of the lantern down the bank and its occasional collision with the trees. A stone or two, which he had dislodged in its descent, rattled behind it into the profundities of the glen, and then silence, like night, resumed its sway, and they might bend their hearing to its utmost pitch, but naught was to be heard except the rain, now marching to the wind, now steadily falling over miles of open country. They were so nearly at the end of their abhorred task that they judged it wisest to complete it in the dark. The coffin was exhumed and broken open, the body inserted into the dripping sack and carried between them to the gig, one mounted to keep it in place, and the other, taking the horse by the mouth, groped along by wall and bush until they reached the wider road by the fisher's tryst. Here was a faint, diffused radiancy, which they hailed like daylight, by that they pushed the horse to a good pace and began to rattle along merrily in the direction of the town. They had both been wetted to the skin during their operations, and now, as the gig jumped along the deep ruts, the thing that stood propped between them fell now upon one and now upon the other. At every repetition of the horrid contact, each instinctively repelled it with the greater haste, and the process, natural though it was, began to tell upon the nerves of the companions. Macfarlane made some ill-favoured jest about the farmer's wife, but it came hollowly from his lips and was allowed to drop in silence. Still their unnatural burden bumped from side to side, and now the head would be laid as if in confidence upon their shoulders, and now the drenching sackcloth would flap icily about their faces. A creeping chill began to possess the soul of Fetz. He peered at the bundle, and it seemed somehow larger than at first. All over the countryside, and from every degree of distance, the farm dogs accompanied their passage with tragic ululations, and it grew and grew upon his mind that some unnatural miracle had been accomplished, that some nameless change had befallen the dead body, and that it was in fear of their unholy burden that the dogs were howling. "'For God's sake,' said he, making a great effort to arrive at speech, "'for God's sake, let's have a light!' Seemingly, Macfarlane was affected in the same direction, for though he made no reply, he stopped the horse passed the reins to his companions, got down and proceeded to rekindle the remaining lamp. They had by that time got no farther than the crossroad down to Orkinclinny. The rain still poured as though the deluge were returning, and it was no easy matter to make a light in such a world of wet and darkness. When at last the flickering blue flame had been transferred to the wick and began to expand and clarify, 
and shed a wide circle of misty brightness round the gig, it became possible for the two young men to see each other and the thing they had along with them. The rain had moulded the rough sacking to the outlines of the body underneath. The head was distinct from the trunk, the shoulders plainly modelled, something at once spectral and human riveted their eyes upon the ghastly comrade of their drive. For some time Macfarlane stood motionless, holding up the lamp. A nameless dread was swathed like a wedge sheet about the body and tightened the white skin upon the face of Fetz. A fear that was meaningless, a horror of what could not be, kept mounting to his brain. Another beat of the watch, and he had spoken, but his comrade forestalled him. That is not a woman, said Macfarlane in a hushed voice. It was a woman when we put her in, whispered Fetz. Hold that lamp, said the other. I must see her face. And as Fetz took the lamp, his companion untied the fastenings of the sack and drew down the cover from the head. The light fell very clear upon the dark, well-moulded features and smooth-shaven cheeks of a too familiar countenance, often beheld in dreams of both of these young men. A wild yell rang up into the night. Each leap from his own side into the roadway, the lamp fell, broke, and was extinguished, and the horse, terrified by this unusual commotion, bounded and went off towards Edinburgh at a gallop, bearing along with it, sole occupant of the gig, the body of the dead and long-dissected Grey. Simone, first impressions, please. You're up. It was great up until the end. I didn't like the ending. Okay. But no, otherwise I thought it was great. Really good build-up of tension and spookiness. The dynamics between the characters were interesting. Everything I have to love with antagonistic characters and their interesting discussions. Yeah, I, I thought the atmosphere was done well. The characters were portrayed in a very scarily believable way. And although the structure was a bit strange and I have my own misgivings about the ending, overall, it's a good story. Uh, Mel, anything to add? Um, This story creeped me out like a lot, which is both great because that's what it's supposed to do. And bad because, you know, I don't want nightmares about creepy people coming and stealing things from graves. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, everyone is going to make a living somehow. They're only following supply and demand. (laughs) Well... I know, but that that's kind of what makes it so scary to me as well, that I, I fully believe people would do it for money and ooh, shudders. <laughs> so I'm guessing you would never rob a grave for money. I would not have the courage to do it for a start and also anything to do with body horror, any gore, it really grosses me out. If I watch zombie movies, they have to be really cartoonily gory, otherwise I will not I will not be able to do it. Probably, like, Shaun of the Dead is fine. Anything much worse than that, and I'm not okay. <laughs> I think I lack the upper body strength of grave robbery myself, but, you know. You have the psychological strength, but not, not physical. Yeah, not the biceps for it. <laughs> they dug, like, the body up in 20 minutes or something. I could never do that. <laughs> I know. Impressive. I'm just, after that, I just imagine the characters are ripped <laughs> throughout the whole thing. Like <laughs> They work out. Handsome medical doctors who look like they've been to the gym several times a week. It's not the body horror that does it to me, it's the psychological stuff. So I really think like the creepiest part is when his his friend and the class assistant has just straight up murdered this guy. And he has this horrible moment where he realises that he's kind of complicit in it. But he overlooks it and then he comes around so quickly to this other guy's way of thinking. And the way his brain just corrects itself to get into the mindset where this is just kind of okay to him. That's the part that gets me. Like, that's the really scary part. Yeah, it worked for me. I think it was quite realistic. Like, I know not everyone's going to autocorrect that as easily. All jokes of, I only lack the bicep strength aside. But it was also a lot more, felt a lot more authentic to how someone's mind would actually work, kind of grappling with the guilt of what they've done. And, like, you can kind of see how the thought process works of, oh god, I've gone too far into this now, may as well commit the whole way. When he's confronting the guy, he's aware that he's on on the verge of making the enemy of someone who has just committed murder. And that's uh, that's enough to make him sign his name where it needs to go. Yes. And then after that, he's kind of trapped, right? Like, he's already part of the crime. 
And then there's, I think, also the element of the question on whether or not the um, teacher knows about it or not. If it's a figure of authority, you'd be letting down if you bring it down on all of them. Yeah, there's that, that part of human psychology, right, where if someone tells us to do something, we don't really question it too much. Like, if you look into the Milgram experiment, people will just... If you give them orders, they'll just do it. I guess it's like a self-defense thing. You want to believe that you're a good person so your brain will do whatever it can to convince you and also if if someone higher up than you is is part of something you kind of move the blame onto them right i mean it is also legitimately probably harder to go up against for example your very well respected teacher and mentor because realistically even outside the context of a story whistleblowing in that context would have consequences so this story was a response to current events at the time, I suppose, um, in that this was very closely and directly related to a real incident and in fact references um, one of the people indirectly. Yeah, so the person they refer to as Dr. K is probably Dr. Knox, who was a professor at the Edinburgh Medical School at the time, and in his classes they dissected human bodies to teach the students, and he was the one who bought the bodies but he didn't ask where they came from so it's possible that he suspected you know these were murder victims but nobody could prove he was complicit in it so he kind of got off scot-free the famous people who committed the murders are burke and hare if you google them you'll probably find a famous pub in edinburgh named after them but (laughs) if you look at the murders they basically murdered people Um, in order to sell them to the medical students to dissect because at the time there weren't enough bodies for all the medical students that wanted to go into the field. They were in high demand and there was a law in Scotland that meant you could only use, I think it was suicide victims, prisoners and foundlings or something like that. So that sort of created an industry wherein um, people robbed graves and sold the bodies. It got so bad that people would put things in to stop grave robbers they would put they would hire stones to put over the graves and leave them there until the body had decayed so it couldn't be used for the medical purposes Um, they would put watchtowers on the graveyards or they would use iron boxes to keep people out so burke and hare decided you know we can't rob graves anymore it's too hard so i guess we'll just murder people instead i think burke was the one who originally confessed but later he sort of talked about Hare doing a lot of the work as well. Someone worked out who one of the murder victims was and reported it. So he was caught and um, they hanged him and then gave his body to the medical students, (laughs) (laughs) which is still in the uh, Edinburgh, one of the museums in Edinburgh. You can still go see his skeleton. There is rumoured to be a book made of his skin somewhere. We went on this ghost walk and they talked about it in Edinburgh, didn't they? <laughs> Love me a ghost walk. I'd never heard of the, uh, I'd never heard of it before then, and I was like, oh, oh what a gory story. And then uh, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson probably heard all this and was fascinated and wrote a story. Yeah, can't really blame him. It is fascinating in a horrible way, but then it was hard to live and money. You needed money, really. So. Yeah. But yeah, that's uh, the basis for this story. This is, I guess, the historical context just makes it all the more horrifying yeah and i honestly think that the context is for me is the most interesting thing about this story i would not have enjoyed it nearly as much if i didn't know that it was it could have happened yeah so i want to talk a bit more about the structure of the story because it is a bit strange first of all we have a narrator but he's only really present at the start of the story and he explains this strange incident where um the Doctor and and McFarlane kind of, they're reunited and and have some strange discussion. And then his group of friends gather around and try to piece together what they think the whole story is. And the version of events that we're told is presumably what our narrator's version of of events is, which he must have somehow pieced together from things he knows about effects and and from their conversation, which is is a very strange way to tell a story. It is. It's one of We've come across a lot on this podcast, I think, with framing devices. Like, it came up in our recent story of the Phantom Force. Similar, yeah. I'm not personally a fan. I think the story would have been a lot more effective if we just jumped straight in with this 
excited, budding young medical student. But in this story, it's slightly different because instead of having the framing narrative around the story, we just have it at the front and then it kind of fades, it fades into the background. Yes, it doesn't wrap back at the end. It kind of leaves it feeling unfinished because you never come back full circle. Well, given, given the first part of the story, it's these people trying to explain what they think has happened when they've called for a doctor and then their friend has, has freaked the hell out. So in that sense, it, it makes sense. What doesn't really make sense to me is, is how he knows so much, or in fact, it's kind of implied that he doesn't really know the full story, but he's telling us, he's telling it like he does know. Yeah, I find it confusing. I think I think I agree. I, would, I wish the first half wasn't there. <laughs> it would have been cleaner. So do we think, in that case, do we think the later meeting between these two characters is unnecessary? Yeah. Yeah, for the story that it's planning to tell, it diverts attention away because you expect it to come to something all those years later for it to open with that and make a point of them meeting again. I, I, I kind of agree, but I do like the part where we get to see these characters after a great deal of time has passed and we see the different ways that they've coped with what they've done, where McFarlane just kind of keeps coasting and just carries on moving because he's that kind of person. But, but Fetz just kind of goes, drinks, um, kind of loses himself in, in this guilt. I thought that was quite interesting. And it's it's weird that it's done at the at the start. It is. Yeah. If they'd had like a time break or a time skip in the middle, it would have, I don't know, made more sense. It'll even just split it in between. So you get up to the bit where he realises it's the doctor that he knows and you're left hanging on a kid head and they know that flashback and then finish the rest of the conversation. Yeah, perhaps that would work better. I can kind of see why it was done this way because the ending as it is is quite dramatic and you want to just leave on the on the high note. I think that was the idea. Let's talk about the ending a bit more because we, we seem to be not, not sure about how it should be. I quite liked the ending. Uh, why? It felt like just like a jump scare to finish the thing off. And the only impossible thing in this story that had a fairly realistic narrative, I liked the contrast of it and it made it creepier to me because I didn't, I suppose, go, oh, that couldn't happen because I'd been so embroiled in this quite, you know, realistic story. I was like, oh God, that makes it worse. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it feel more legit to me. <laughs> so, so something so, literally impossible makes it seem more real? No, because the rest of it seems real it makes that impossible thing seem possible interesting i felt it somewhat undermined the story by having what is apparently just an act of god at the end hmm. the psychological horror would have been interesting enough on its own and would have carried more weight without the supernatural element like the scary element of oh god how is that going to get out of the situation that he's gotten into okay he's been corrupted where is he going to go from there i think would have been more interesting questions Particularly because we set him up to feel so guilty at the beginning of the story. You have to wonder, okay, what does he really do? Because at this point, he's covered it up and you're like, yeah, sure, you'll feel bad about that. But he's not actually been responsible for killing anyone at this point. So I was kind of expecting something to happen. So something to push him over the edge. Yes, and while I can kind of see a ghost being as like the literal rising version of his guilt felt cheaper to me than if they'd had an act finished off their actual really effective moral dilemma. I'm not so sure about that because that feels to me like just repeating what's already been told with, with McFarlane who is presumably kind of complicit in the crimes at first and then ended up doing it himself later on. Fair, but where they ended up the story you had Fetz in a position where even McFarlane seemed uneasy about how easy Fetz was with talking about things. Like he was setting up the dynamic which it had had with Grey, where Grey was taking advantage of him because he knew his secrets, with McFarlane being in a similar position with Fetz, and then it didn't go anywhere. Oh, I see. So it's like it didn't quite develop the relationship between the two of them. Yeah, like that conversation in the pub right before the end was the whole point about McFarlane being very uneasy when Fetz is talking about it, and, well, you owe me now. And there was the implication that... McFarlane owed Grey earlier because otherwise why would he be taking his orders? Yeah. Because we have this act where they see the body of someone they've already disposed of, it seems so impossible. I wondered if that was just the interpretation of the narrator 
who clearly doesn't have the full information of the whole story and is trying to piece things together from this really hurried conversation in in the in the present tense and that says something like have you seen him again which is obviously alluding to seeing some kind of ghost and then perhaps our narrator is just trying to piece something together that fits that story it was kind of how i interpreted it I forgot about the have you seen him again that does make the ending make more sense yeah but also i still don't like it i thought it had such good psychological horror without the ghost i agree and i think to some extent, although I, I do know, realize it would take some steam out of the ending, I would prefer to have that scene afterwards happen, so everything happens in chronological order. I think it works at the start if you had something else at the end to bring it back. That too, that would work. So, um, one of the key elements within the story is the medical anxiety, that's what causes part of the horror, isn't it? Like, it's the idea of that even when someone's dead, we still have a certain level of respect for the dead, and it's to do with the anxiety, I guess, of what our doctors or medical people would do, and the, I guess, the general superstition around science at the time as a developing field. So I guess I was interested in, would that still resonate today? Just because horror is often based on um, the anxieties of the time, so... To me, it's not about any ideas about spiritualism around the bodies. It's more the narrative of the characters committing murder for money. And that's definitely something that, that still resonates. That's kind of a timeless idea. One of my favourite horror stories is about a pop star who wants a face transfer. So he grooms a girl in order to try and steal her face. It's a horrifying story and it plays on the f way pop stars reinvent themselves and the way they use cosmetic surgery and it was very brilliantly done. So uh, yeah, I think body horror is, is still going to happen and the villain in that story is a, is a plastic surgeon who goes too far with his work. So a similar kind of villain to the ones in this, in this story and it was written, you know, I think late noughties, so I, I don't know if there are any other fam more famous ones. This one was Sarah's Face by Melvin Burgess, but that story always stays with me for how creepy it is. <laughs> you know, I just always find it interesting with horror on how much it's a product of its time and how much of it's a more universal thing. I think the majority of horror is relative, is mostly timeless, I'd say. Like, there are ideas that come in and out of, like, public consciousness, but a lot of these things that end up being a big part of horror, like body horror and psychological horror, are kind of, they're more primal, right? They're, they're kind of based on more base instincts, or well, that's how it feels to me. Yeah, there's a certain universality to it. Yeah. How do we want to wrap up, unless anyone has any further points? Can uh, I can I read the Burke and Hare rhyme? There's a rhyme? There's a rhyme. So this rhyme went round Edinburgh um, in the 1800s. Up the close and down the stair, in the house with Burke and Hare, Burke's the butcher, Hare's the thief, knocks the man who buys the beef. Burke and Hare, they were a pair, killed a wife and did not care. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? Oh, it's, I, it's, it's brilliant. I just, I just like that it rhymes mostly. And I'm sorry I couldn't read it in a Scottish accent. Clearly, newspapers don't have the same level of sensation as them when it comes to murders anymore. <laughs> what do you have to do to get a nursery rhyme after yourself these days? God. All right, thanks for listening. As always, you can find all of our previous stories and episodes on our website at theshortstoryworkshop.com. If you'd like to contact us, you can do so via Twitter. I am at Matt B. Writer, Mel. At Fickaholic. And Simone. P underscore M underscore typewriter, also known as the modern typewriter. Thanks again for listening, and we'll be back with another story next week. Goodbye. Bye.